I will be talking about the uh, wearable cardioverter defibrillator, or also known as um, Life Vest. We just want to go over the literature behind uh, the use, when we should use it, and um, uh, what's the uh, evidence behind it. Okay, so as kind of uh, review, you guys know that heart failure is a, a big problem. There's a 5 million American have a heart failure about 670,000 new cases uh, per year. The five-year mortality uh, of the patient with a heart failure is about 50%. And the patient with a heart failure, uh, has a, they have six to nine times higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest compared to general population. There are more than one million heart failure hospitalization per year. And leading cause of hospitalization for the patients about age of 65 is, is heart failure. The sudden cardiac death uh, accounts for uh, over 300,000 deaths in U.S. One out of third out of hospital arrest is because of the ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And survival from the cardiac arrest is just less than one out of five people. The sudden cardiac death uh, in the trials um, here, uh, kind of summarize a few trials, the merit tire uh, trial, CBIS, uh, the uh, Carvel Law US trial, uh, it's accounted for about 35 to 64% of the total mortality, with the average about 50%. And ejection fraction by itself is a single most important risk factor for sudden cardiac death in these patients. So we all know the importance of uh, ICD implantation in uh, the right patients. Uh, here's some of the trials. Uh, can you see the meta trial? Uh, this is a patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction less than 30%. The clear benefit uh, in the trial and also in the registry you follow after that uh, compared to the medical therapy. In the Scott Health trial, this is a symptomatic heart failure patient with NYHA class 2 to 3, EF less than 35%, all comer ischemic and non ischemic cardiomyopathy. Again, in the right pa patient's clear benefit of the ICD implantation for mortality. So based on those trials, the current recommendation for an ICD implantation is as a class one, our prior MI with an EF less than 35%, symptomatic in YHA class two to three, or uh, ambulatory four. But there's a, a wait period time has to be more than 40 days after MI. EF, the, uh, the second indication class one, MI, uh, prior MI, NYHA class one, EF less than 30%, uh, percent, still there's a 40 days uh, uh, wait period. Or if they have a higher risk MI, for example, they have a, a positive EP study, that's indication level of evidence B. Non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, symptomatic patients, less than 35%, but again, there's a 90 days wait period before this patient we qualify for ICD implantation. So kind of a quick review of, uh, again, ICD indication. Uh, we implant ICD for two major indications. Secondary, these are the patient after uh, cardiac arrest or they have the ventricular tachycardia. Primary, these are kind of clear cut for secondary if they need ICD. The primary either is for structural heart disease like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, primary electric disease like long QT syndrome, and then also the group that we talked previously about significant impaired yeah, LV, EF less than 35%, ischemic, non-ischemic. Non but again, emphasize on there's a wait period before this patient be qualified for implanting the ICD. Just uh, focus on the first part of that, uh, the guideline here. So there's if the primary prevention for the patient with a heart disease, EF less than 40%, if they are less than 40 day, days after MI, or less than 90 days after revascularization, we, everybody is recommended to start a guideline directed medical therapy, class one. If they're a very high risk patient, can do the EP study. If they have inducible VT, ICD is indicated, class one. Um, here's that uh, the variable uh, car cardioverter defibrillator, which I'm gonna be um, referring to it as a life is just easier to say, um, is uh, class two B. So there are a lot of number of the patients before we qualified for ICD he are in this first part of the graph, which we don't have a clear answer what to do for them. 
The rest of this is more clear that we talked about them, the indication for ICD, the second part of the graph. So, so why, why are we waiting? Why, why are we waiting for? Why, why are we waiting for these patients to implant the ICD? Because there's a chance of myocardial recovery on optimal medical therapy. In this uh, 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 article from Jack 2016, these are uh, patients with the EF less than 35%. They were treated on optimal medical therapy as they tolerated. There was a 57% improvement with the ejection fraction less than 30, more than 35%. 26%, they have normalized EF, more than 50%. So we want to make sure that these patients, if they will recover, do we need to commit them to ICD? That's one of the reasons we want to wait. The other one, there's no uh, clear evidence of significant mortality benefit for ICD, with early ICD after MI. These are for ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. This has been looked at the dynamite trial. These are patients post-MI from six to 40 days after the event, EF less than 35 or equal to 35%, and they were followed for 30 months. 30, 332 patients were ICD implanted, 342 patients no ICD. No mortality benefit with the early ICD implantation of this, this, this patient, as you see the graphic, Kaplan myograph on the left side, on the right side. On the risk trial, again, similar. These are the higher risk patients. These are patients EF less than 40%, after MI, 5 to 31 days post MI, they had a heart rate more than 90. They had a non-sustained VT, more than 150 beats. They were followed for 37 months. Again, no mortality benefit of early ICD implantation in these patients. How about non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy patient? The CAT trial, the other patient who ICD was implanted for, uh, for the patient who were diagnosed for less than nine months after diagnosis, EF less than 30%, followed for 5.5 years. No, as you see in the, um, the graph, no cumulative survival was uh, seen for this patient. Was also shown in the Danish trial. This is the specific for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So they excluded all the patient with a significant coronary artery disease. Symptomatic patient in YHA class 2, 2, 2, 4, EF less than 35%, 500 patient ICD, 500 no ICD. The ICD was, uh, when they were diagnosed, within four weeks, they were randomized by ICD or no ICD. Again, they have no cause, cardiovascular death, no difference at all. So, so here, there's no strong evidence for the implant ICD early. But why we are, what, what are the on other side of the coin? Why, why we are concerned of these patients? Why are they waiting for it to be evaluated and become a, uh, a ICD become uh, indicated? So in, in this uh, uh, follow-up here um, from, from uh, New England Journal of Medicine 2005, the risk of sudden cardiac death post-MI was highest in the first 30 days. This patient had a four to six times greater chance of having a sudden cardiac death after MI compared to general population. And the lower EF, the higher risk for having a um, sudden cardiac death. EF less than 30%, you see uh, 2.25 uh, rate of sudden death compared to general population. 83% of the sudden cardiac death occurs after hospital discharge. And just the survival is just 74% of this patient who had a resuscitation, resuscitation after, uh, in the first 30 days were alive in one year. So low um, survival rate of this patient. So we, we always say that, okay, let's wait uh, for them. We're going to optimize them. Uh, there's a mortality benefit of uh, medical therapy. So let's optimize them and then see if, if what happens. So we know that uh, the medical therapy obviously has been shown there's a mortality benefit. Uh, however, most of these medical therapy benefit, you can see them later. For example, beta blocker uh, uh, trials, uh, see all three of them with the metoprolol, carvedilol, and bisoprolol you see the separation of the graphs about three months after. So again, during that period of the time, this patient, how much mortality benefit of these patients? So there's a concern for the, this population. So there, there's a, so also there's some gap of in, in evidence. Most of the trial, patients who were diagnosed less than, less than three months were excluded from the trial. There's no uh, complete randomized trial, especially for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then the MI uh, patient who were uh, included in the trial were very selected patients 
and there was enrollment of their this rate was about less than two percent enrollment. So there's a concern of uh, uh, generalizability of this uh, uh, results for the uh, all the patients, all the all commerce. And also there's some of the trial, for example, the Villian trial, yet less than 30 percent, 21 percent of the cardiac arrest was happened for the uh, first 30 days after MI, and 51 percent of those were arrhythmic dead. In the, in the trial, even though the overall trial there was no no a significant difference between two group of ICD, no ICD, but in the subgroup and uh, the who were diagnosed with their uh, uh, cardiomyopathy less than within um, nine months, the IE that group, that group has 48% lower uh, uh, risk of mortality to in, the, in the ICD patient. So that's raised up the question, raised up the question, uh, you know, the other side that is the ICD benefit time dependent, and it should be, it should you know what to do with this patient that they're waiting for get the ICD based on the guidelines. So that's, what, that's where the discussion for the wearable cardioverter uh, defibrillator or life pets comes. So a little bit introduction. Uh, this was described in, uh, first in 1998. There was a uh, 15 patients were uh, wearing their life vest. The arrhythmia was detected in 10 of these patients. These are 15 of the patients at the cardiac arrest. The arrhythmia was detected in nine of these patients and the defibrillation was successful in nine of these patients. So the life vest, um, uh, is, is, uh, life vest has been, has been uh, uh, manufactured by the Zoll company, is designed for a patient with a uh, risk for sudden cardiac, high risk for sudden cardiac death, and not indicated for, not a candidate for ICD. They also, the benefit of that is there's no surgical operation for um, wearing their uh, life vest and has been approved in the United States in 2002. So this, uh, this is how it looks like, the life vest. Uh, has a two primary components. It's a variable garment, which has a sensing electrolyte, uh, electrodes, defibrillation electrodes, and then had the four electrodes and two uh, lead system. And has a battery, which the patient, they wear it either at the belt or the shoulder uh, strap. The sensitivity uh, of detection is about 90 to 100 percent. It's pretty good. Also, the specificity, 98 to 99 percent. And an appropriate shock has been reported just one to two percent in these patients. So that's what hap when it happens when the arrhythmia detected by the life vest. Uh, the, it's the, the vibration alert first gets activated. Then the patient is going to hear the siren. The siren gets louder. And then uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, there's a, the audible uh, command says the electrical shock possible. That gives the patient at that time to, uh, there's a button, there's a responsiveness button, the patient that if they think this is not a real event and they're feeling fine, they can reject the shock. But if they don't do that, then the gel release and then uh, the device will says do not touch the patient and the shock will deliver. So the, uh, look at the, the uh, experience with this uh, life vest. There's a 98% first shock success rate, 92% shock event survival. And uh, most of this shock, about 75%, happens within 60 seconds uh, of the uh, activation of the life vest. So uh, response time mostly from, happens between 25 to 60 se seconds. Energy is from 75 to 150 joule by phasic. Efficacy is about 70 to 99 percent. This device can deliver up to five shocks, but after each treatment, the uh, treatment, the garment, and the electrolyte must be electrodes must be replaced. There, what's the relative contraindication? If the patient has a unipolar pacing, and that's the re that's that's because that pacing can interfere with detection of the arrhythmia and can interfere uh, with the with maybe oversensing, that's contraindication. Patient with the, uh, um, who cannot detect or respond to the response of the test, they cannot, as a relative contraindication to wear the life vest. What's the limitation? There's no pacing capability. Uh, patient comfort is a big issue that causes uh, a lot of non-compliance and not be able to wear this uh, life vest. As we know, the life vest is effective if the patient wear it. If they don't wear it, it doesn't work. Extreme body habitus, for example, too small of the body or obesity can be a problem. 
And also the patient after surgery, if they have a wound on the chest, it's gonna be difficult to wear these uh, life vests. So let's look at the, the, the data behind the life vest. What do we have so far? The feasibility trial uh, was a, a wear it trial. This is where, this is where the patient with a symptomatic heart failure class three and four, EF less than 30%. At that time, they didn't meet the eligibility for ICD. And then patient um, had a recent MI and had a, so they were high risk patient, VT within 48 hours, EF less than 30% at least three days after the event, and had an episode of the syncope or sudden cardiac arrest at least 48 hours after the event. And simultaneously, the other trial was going on, a viral trial. This is for a cabbage patient, um, uh, which is a, again, very similar, VT within 48 hours after cabbage, EF less than 30%, three days after uh, cabbage, had a syncope at least 48 hours, or sudden cardiac arrest 48 hours after cabbage. And they were, at that time, they, even though they met the ICD, uh, they, they either they were waiting for ICD or they were a candidate for ICD, but they, for some reason they were not expecting to have, a, have an ICD for four months, or the patient refused the ICD. So this, this trial trials started separately, but then uh, from the request of the FDA, uh, these two trials combined. 298 patients, uh, 177 in the wear and 112 in the by road. And from and the, in the, the follow-up on these patients, six out of eight defibrillation attempted, 75% were successful. 12 patients died, six of them were not sudden cardiac death, five of them were sudden cardiac death, the patient were not wearing the device at that time. One patient just was wearing the device, but wearing it not correctly. So this, uh, again, 24% worked that the patient discontinued, mostly because of the uh, discomfort. So this, uh, this, this, uh, these two trials combination, it met the feasibility goal. And that was based on the historical bystander resuscitation survive, uh, success, which is about 25%. So wearing the life vest, there was a 99% confidence that the true success rate will be at least 25% or higher. That was the goal of the trial, meet the feasibility um, uh, goal for this combination of the trial. Where it two registry um, from 2011-2014, uh, put 2,000 patients that wearing the life vest, 40% ischemic, 46% non-ischemic, 13% congenital or uh, inherited uh, diseases, um, uh, cardiomyopathy. Here, uh, there, there was a uh, number of the patient, percentage of the patient who were, uh, some type of arrhythmia was detected. 2.1% had a VTVF, 1.5% uh, with uh, VTVF, which was therapy, was done. 1.4% non-sustained VT. Atrial arrhythmia was detected about 3.6% is systole and 0.3%. So one out of 14 patients, about 7%, had some type of arrhythmia detected that requires some type of an intervention. What happened to this patient uh, over time? About 40% EF improved. They didn't need ICD. About 42% EF didn't improve. Uh, and patient required ICD placement on follow-up. So few clinical experience in the, in the real life. Uh, and from 2002 to 2006, 3,569 patients uh, was wearing the life vest at least one day. Mean duration was 53 days. Discontinuation, again, a, a big percentage, 14%. An indication for the wearing a life vest, mostly was ICD explantation, for, for example, for the infection, VT before uh, uh, planned ICD, 16%, recent MI, 16%, post-cabbage, 9%, and recent diagnosis of the cardiomyopathy, 28%. 80, 80, 80 episode events with a VT or VF at 50 and 59% were detected. Most of them were devices were uh, at the, because of the, uh, this event was happening, the patient who had the explanted devices, you had a device and they had to explain them, there was an interruption of the ICD for some reason, for example, infection. <laughs> First shock efficacy was 99%. 2% received an appropriate shock, mostly because of the signal noises, about 68%. Supraventricular tachycardia, about 27%. Non-sustained VT, 6%. Oversensing, 4%. Loss of signal, about 4%. So uh, based on what we had so far, um, the, the came up with these guidelines. Um, the 2015 European 
Society of Cardiology guideline uh, gives a uh, class 2B indication level of evidence C that life vests can be considered for adult patients with poor LV systolic function who are at the risk of sudden arrhythmia death for a limited period but, uh, but are not candidate for an implantable defibrillator. For example, bridge transplant, um, peripartum cardiomyopathy, uh, active myocardial uh, um, arrhythmia, and the early postmyocardial infarction phase. Then, I also give a uh, 2B level of evidence C for the ICD uh, who are patient waiting for the ICD implantation. For example, uh, patients who had a, a MI uh, or less than uh, 40 days after the myocardial infarction, uh, the patient had a class 2B indication. Uh, the, then in 2016, the American Heart uh, Association came with a uh, science advisory um, document, and these are the, here are the doc, um, recommendation. Use of uh, life vest is reasonable when there is a clear indication for an implantable device, but it has been interrupted for some reason, like infection. That get, uh, got class 2 indication. Their life is reasonable as a bridge for more definitive uh, therapy, like a heart uh, cardiac transplantation, class 2A. As a life uh, uh, waste is reasonable when there is a concern for a, a, um, the high risk sudden cardiac death patient. These are for a patient, for example, ischemic heart disease with a recent revascularization, new diagnosis of non ischemic cardiomyopathy that are waiting uh, for optimization or secondary cardiomyopathy, for example, like a cardiomediated thyroid disease, that's got class 2B indication. Life vets is be appropriate as a uh, bridging therapy in situation associated with the increased risk of sudden cardiac death. For example, uh, overall, you know, has been um, sudden cardiac death, but not overall survival, such as within phase of the MI. Uh, these are patients that within four days, uh, strong evidence that there's a mortality benefit, but can consider it in this patient if they have a high risk for sudden cardiac death. 2017, uh, an AHA, a guideline came that uh, gives a class 2A indication, level of evidence, no randomized trial. In a patient uh, with an actual history of the sudden cardiac death or sustained ventricular arrhythmia, uh, in whom removal what is required. For example, for the infection, and a 2B indication of uh, the level of the B randomized trial are the patients that we talked about are eligible for ICD, but they are not meeting the wait period for so four weeks after MI or 90 days after uh, revascularization. After this guideline, the one of the uh, big trial, the first randomized trial, was a VEST trial which was uh, done in 2018. This is a multi-center randomized open-label trial. Enrolled, pa enrolled the patient seven days after hospital discharge and after acute MI and EF less than 35% was randomized two to one to either LIFES plus um, guideline directed medical therapy or just guideline directed medical therapy. The crossover uh, and early ICD was prohibited uh, except if there was uh, indication for secondary prevention. And arrhythmia detected by a device was not reported unless a shock was delivered. Here, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, less than seven days after uh, hospital discharge for acute MI, EF less than 35%, has to be more than at least eight hours after MI, more than eight hours after PCI, more than 48 hours after cabbage. Ex exclusion criteria, um, uh, has was as existing ICD has a significant valvular disease, unipolar pacing system, chronic uh, hemodialysis, chest is too small or, or too large for life vest, discharge to sniff more than seven days or pregnancy. So the endpoint uh, uh, outcome, this trial were primary end, a primary endpoint was sudden cardiac death uh, and death uh, due to ventricular arrhythmia. And there were secondary endpoints with total mortality and non-sudden death, cause specific death um, or non-fatal outcomes. And the patient were followed at one month and three months. Here, the patient population, age about 60, per, uh, 60. Uh, most of them were men, about 62%, uh, BMI about 28, 
mostly white, 84 to 82%. Uh, thir one third had diabetes, 60%, 65% hypertension, 25% MI, about 10% had a cabbage, a quarter had a PCI, and uh, EF was about 28%. Most of them were class one, two, uh, NYHA class one to two, and about 13% class three, with a very low number, about two to three percent class in YHA class four. They were pretty well uh, optimized in medical therapy. Beta blocker, about 92%, ACE or ARP, 87%, spinolactone, epirinone, 40, 45%, and uh, um, there were 7% were in amiodarone. The uh, treatment um, for this patient, patient um, who uh, were um, you look at the device, device group versus the control group, um, and uh, uh, put kind of your attention to the number of hours they were wearing it. The about median about 18 hours uh, were wearing the, the patient were wearing a device in the device group, and the mean was 14 hours a day. And uh, the ICD implantation uh, on the follow up there was no difference in these uh, in these two uh, groups. Uh, of, of the percentage of the patient who end up getting the ICD implantation or follow up. Primary endpoint, again, to remind sudden death uh, or, or ventricular tachyarrhythmias, there was no difference between the control group and uh, life test group with a p value of 0 0.18. The non arrhythmic death, no difference at, again between the control group. It was a little bit uh, less, as you see it on the graph, but there was not statistically significant difference. The only difference was that tell, uh, was death from any cause. And you look at the, the life test group was lower, 0.04, uh, about 35.5% relative risk reduction, this patient. So if you look at the specific cause of death in these patients, uh, again, sudden death, no difference, congestive heart failure, no difference, recurrent MI, no different. Stroke was different, one of the 0.5% uh, uh, versus 0%. One of the hypotheses was because maybe these patients were, uh, the arrhythmia was detected early and there was some type of uh, intervention was done. For example, if they detected atrial fibrillation, if they were starting anticoagulation, that's why maybe the stroke was prevented. Other cardiovascular death, no difference. And uh, um, again, any cause of death, which we're gonna be sure that we talked about in the graph uh, was, was different in these two patients. And 11 patients were wearing their life vest when that happened, when the death happened. As far as a non-fatal event, rehospitalization, either it's cardiovascular or any cause, no difference between these two groups. So in the device group, look at, uh, dissect a little more, about uh, 38 out of 48 uh, pa uh, deaths in the device, so 48 patients died in the device group. 36 out of 48 uh, were not wearing their life vest when they, when they, uh, they passed. 12 patients who died were wearing the uh, life vest. Nine of them were arrhythmic death. And from those nine, four was ventricular tachycardia, which was appropriately shocked, but the patient continued having the recurrent ventricular tachycardia and the shocking was not enough. And the remaining, there was no tachyarrhythmia was recorded on these patients. This is, uh, and, and they did a statistic uh, analysis, kind of a little bit uh, uh, fancy statistic analysis they did. Uh, basically, what, from, uh, what I got from it was they were looking to see if this total mortality, any cause, it is really, it's, it, it is significant always by, by the chance. Uh, so they, they kind of explained that, that the total mortality, the arrhythmic death was not separate from this total mortality. And after removing that, the analysis that they did, there's most likely the total mortality was different by chance. But it is what it is. There was some difference with the total mortality as a, as a secondary outcome, not the primary outcome. They also looked at the as treated analysis. There was a patient who was actually wearing the life vest. Then there was a association with a 57% reduction in arrhythmic death with the uh, relative risk of 0 0.43 was significant and 74% reduction in mortality overall. These are actually as treated analysis. What has to take it with a grain of salt because it's, uh, again, it was not the intent of the trial. So the conclusion of the VEST trial, the patient with the recent myocardial infarction and EF less than 35%, life vest did not lead to a significant decrease in arrhythmic death. 
there was some limitation. There were five percent of the dead were educated as a being indetermined. So that could have changed the result if there was a rhythmic death or not. So and also it's it's, it's, dif it's difficult for a lot of patients to definitely determine if it's a rhythmic death or not, which is some of the, most of the trial people looked at it. There was a, about 50 to 60 percent of the presumed sudden cardiac death was actually related to rhythmic origin. And uh, there was a, a significant decrease of the using of the life vest uh, over time. Inappropriate shock in this group, 60, was because either uh, was inappropriately detected or the patient was failed to uh, press the response button. 68% was because of noise, 27% supraventricular tachycardia, 6% non sustained VT, 4% over sensing, and 4% loss of uh, signal. So the, uh, the, in this patient, 72% of the patient um, at least had one arrhythmic uh, alarm in 90 days. And 9.6% had more than 100 alarms. And an appropriate uh, shock overall was very low in this patient, a 0.6% in 90 days. There was a German cohort, which is another big cohort. They looked at it. The inappropriate shock at that cohort was just 0.4%. So low compared to what was reported before. Compliance, as we talked, is a big issue in this patient. You know, they're uncomfortable wearing the life vests. Um, so they, they looked at multiple cohorts here. The U.S. nationwide registry. Median daily use about 21 hours. Mean daily use about 19 hours. 14% uh, patients stopped with the discomfort or adverse reaction. The German cohort, the median daily was 22 hours. The Swiss cohort, median daily was 22 uh, hours, and 8% were discontinued. However, in the West, which is the only randomized trial which was done, the median uh, daily use was significantly lower than that compared to what was reported. Is about 18 hours a day, and mean daily use was just 14 hours a day. And here, kind of show it the same thing based on the graph. Number of the patient that they use it decreased from 80% to almost 40% by end of the 90 days. Number of the hours from the, the patient were actually using the life vest dropped about from 22 to about 19 hours, and the median dropped significantly as well. So, so, so what to do? There are a lot of mixed information here. There was some benefit uh, uh, from the life vest in the early trial. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to lose a life vest, but then the only randomized trial didn't show, uh, didn't meet the primary endpoint. So they, there was this meta-analysis was done in 2019. This year, uh, looked at all the trials from the life vest from between 2000, uh, January 2001 to March 2018. And they looked at the, uh, the keywords of a variable cardiovascular defibrillator or life vest and have appropriate shock responded. 28 studies were included in this meta-analysis. 27 studies were observational. And the vest was the only randomized trial. 32,426 patients were um, included in this meta-analysis. 20 study of the 28% used the data from or was sponsored by Zoll. So this is the trial basically we're kind of looking at to see how, what's the, uh, uh, you know, how we can, how much we can trust the data from the old observational study compared to other randomized trial that we have. The incidence of appropriate shock overall for the older trials, if you look at the right, there's ischemic, non-ischemic, and mixed. For overall, was five per hundred person over three months. And there was a significant difference between the type of um, uh, cardiomyopathy. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, eight per 100 person for over three months, non-ischemic six uh, per 100 person over three months, and mix was just three. And the vest, if you look at it, it's very low compared to that, it was just one, uh, one for 100 person over three months. So there was a huge discrepancy between all the observational trial versus the randomized trial that we have. And this is kind of a uh, break of the appropriate treatment appropriate shock and appropriate based on the cardiomyopathy. And there was a, a difference between the ischemic cardiomyopathy patient had more appropriate shock compared to the other type of cardiomyopathy. So the conclusion of the meta-analysis was most studies were not um, indication specific. Therefore, it could dilute our knowledge. 
as, as we said, there was a huge discrepancy between the VEST, which was a randomized trial, versus the all other observational trial that we have. There's a selection bias, and including um, mixed indication in observational study, um, which kind of uh, can affect the rate of appropriate shot. So, and they made this uh, uh, strong uh, sentence in the conclusion that the findings suggest that life tests should not be used in the primary prevention until further randomized clinical trial data support its use. So uh, lastly, I just want uh, to tell you about this, this, this feature that they, the life has uh, for the patient, you know, that as so far we said there's a mixed data to use, not to use the life vest. But the, if the patient that do have the life vest, there are these trends that, you, that we can use. For example, the heart rate, average daily heart rate, their activity, total of the steps, the body position, if they're upright or in a recliner or laying down. And also you can ask the question of this patient. There's a health uh, survey that the patient can respond to your questions. That's how it looks like. You can look at the, um, the, uh, the heart rate average, the activity, uh, the body position. That gives you some information um, that it can be used for the patient that are wearing their life vest. And you also can ask the question. They have a 12 question that you can ask like, how many pillows they're sleeping up, if they're feeling dizzy, if they're short of breath, and they can answer it by on, on their, their monitor that they have, they can answer to your question. That's a helpful uh, tool to follow and see how these patients are doing. So in the conclusion, sudden cardiac death remains a major cause of death. The studies have not supported the clear benefit of early ICD implantation. These are the patients that, you know, uh, with the MI, less than 40 days uh, or new diagnosis that waiting for optimization. So data is mixed regarding the benefit of the uh, life vest. A life vest can be considered cautiously in a patient with a high risk of sudden cardiac death. And obviously this is a call for more studies um, that are required to answer our questions about uh, how, what are the uh, cohorts that we should really consider wearing the life vest and what are the patients that we can really benefit the most from the life vest? Yeah, so I think to your point, um, I agree. Uh, anybody with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and a low EF should not be getting a variable defibrillator, right? The risk is not high enough. But I, I like that you have the risk um, numbers that you had, like 5 in 100 or 6 in 100. It's interesting in that data that... Um, uh, 1800 was for ischemic versus it was only 600. Is that, am I reading it wrong? So the ischemics had higher risk, right? Not the other way around. No, you're uh, absolutely right. Ischemic were the highest. Let me bring that. You can look at it again here. I think that's an important point here. Um, so, so here, um, so the ischemic one, the yeah. first box, the total, the diamond here, the highest one is about eight. Eight. Yeah per hundred per person. The non-ischemic one, about six, and mixed, uh, everything else about three. And then if you look at the interaction, actually the ischemic one was statistically significant, uh, more appropriate shock in the ischemic cohort versus the other one. So you're absolutely right. The ischemic looks like has the, the most benefit than every other group. Yeah, in the community, I think, unfortunately, there's a bias where lower the EF, the more worried the practitioners are. So if somebody's EF at outset is like 20%, I think they're, 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 they are they're get slapped on the uh, life rest. But we should recognize that it's a 2B recommendation. And um, unless somebody has some non-sustained VT on telly or they have a big scar, I use kind of those metrics to decide whether we should push this or not for non-ischemics especially. Even for ischemics, uh, say for example, if somebody comes in and has an MI and has a cab, the MRI does not have too much of a scar, would you would you prescribe a life vest, Brian? Uh, if, if, if they don't have, uh, if they have not that much scar and then during the monitoring, they don't have any uh, arrhythmia. I would probably, I, I would not. I would not prescribe this patient. As, as you, your, your point, you know, the patient that showed the most benefit are ischemic, uh, with a uh, uh, lot of scar. 
So those are patients, and also during the hospitalization, if they have any non-sustained VT. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest point, the biggest uh, home, uh, take home point from this, that doesn't mean everybody with the low EF that come to hospital before discharge, they are life risk. That we can tell that based on the data. The rest, the data is mixed and we cannot say 100%, but between those, if you wanna pick a group that you think that has the most benefit are a patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy, have arrhythmias, those and, and the scar and MRI. Those are these are the group that we, we may consider doing that like this before uh, before discharge. Ryan, I can't tell from this chart. Is there actually a signal for the non-ischemics, uh, or it, it doesn't mean significance? So this one, the, the chart that is up. Yeah. Yeah. The the, uh, the appropriate the appropriate shock for ischemic was significantly better compared to non-ischemic and versus mixed. And they were more of the patient who had appropriate, these are appropriate shocks. So it had, had more patients with appropriate shocks in the ischemic cardiomyopathy versus the other groups. Does that answer your question, Barry? Or? Yeah. Ryan, is there any other way to, I guess, risk stratify these people? Because even in the ICD trials, you know, the benefit only, you, you got the benefit only after 12 months. So I still am grappling with the, the need to have any early, you know, uh, early protection. Because I think the, the, in the populations that people have choose, chosen, uh, you know, I feel uh that the incidence is so low that it's going to be very hard to show you know like substantial benefit which is what has been the problem so i think they need to find out a better way to select uh the real high risk cohort yeah yeah i think if i would design a trial with that would be uh, really if they want to show a mortality benefit has to be on the very high risk patients as you said overall when you they look at all the low efs the, 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 the mortality is, is very low. It's very difficult to show them show benefit. Um, so I think that... Um, I mean, both of you are bringing up a, in general, concept of it just even ICD trial, right? Not just life vest. When you look at right. non-ischemics especially, the incidence is low enough that depends on which trial you look and the NYJ classification. Like a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, NYJ1 gets really tricky that they'll even benefit from an ICD. And you can you can argue based on the SCADEF trial. Um, but I think we kind of probably overdo or overreact even for ICDs only because the stakes are high. If I remember right, I kind of quote this data to patients, but if, if you look at after putting an ICD, there were some data which said, out of 100 people, it's only 40% who end up needing it in the context of a proper yep. shock rate, right? So 60% You're right. yeah. don't, so, but you have to put it in 100 for you to benefit the 40%. Okay. Ideally, if the trials incorporated like MRI SCAR or something like that, um, we could have, they used EF, so it's a crude measure. And I don't, unless NIH or somebody pushes, I don't see, just in general for ICDs, that they'll, they'll try to decrease the utilization because the concept is to appropriately utilize in the right people, right? So that's always going to be a problem. For life vest, it gets even more tricky because um, the early period, I, I don't know the benefit of it, even in ischemics. And, but, the, but the governing bodies or the re guideline recommendations are 2B, right? That itself shows if you put 100 people in the room, Majority are actually not for it, but there's not enough majority to make it three because there's some evidence with some benefit. That's how I that's how I look at it. The other question becomes, and Ryan or Barry or you know whatever you, any of you guys can comment. Once somebody gets on the life vest, eh, and I I am sure all of you get these patients who are non-ischemic and they get prescribed life vest and they're seeing you it's tough to take him off of it, right? Are you guys actively saying you don't need it and you'll take off? No, I, I mean, they're, they're on it already. The decision was made. It's very difficult to make that decision. I but, think. but that's for three months. I mean, what do you mean? 
like for three months? Or, yeah, 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 three yeah. months. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I my had, big question they, is that. Go ahead, Barry. I'll, no, no, no. I was going to say I just have some patients that are just so uncomfortable with it; they're not wearing it often, and and they're so unhappy with it that I even if I haven't their EF hasn't recovered, I've let them take it off because they're they're not wearing it half the time anyway, and it's quite burdensome to them. The other comment I want to make: Are, are there any of the of the life vest reps on the phone? I have a question for them. No. Okay, good. It's not really a question. It's a comment um, that just so you guys are aware of what they were doing if, at least a few years ago, is they were going to the social workers and the case managers on the floor, asking for a list of patients that might meet criteria, and then someone in the case manager would get an NP or nurse or someone to request the life test. So these patients would get life tests without us being even ordering them. So everyone with an EF less than 35% that leaves the hospital were getting a life test completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so just FYI, that's how they get their living. That's how they make their salary. Right. But it's completely yeah. uh, ethically uh, inappropriate. So just FYI, yeah. that's uh, some of the things that they're doing. And you see there's not a... And I think that's, that's, a good, that's a very important point because, you know, kind of putting what Barry and Arvin are saying, you know, I, if somebody goes out with a life vest, even non-ischemic, you know, low risk. Uh, it's kind of very, it's, it's very difficult for that follow-up person to take that the life vest away. You know, I think that's that this, that's that's going to be a, a problem. You know, so so I think that kind of that decision has to be made up front that this patient, if they're very low risk, shouldn't go with a life vest. Right, Ryan. I, I had a couple of comments. So the first thing is like when you say someone is high risk, right? I mean, we defined it to some degree based on scar and non-sustained VP on telemetry and ischemic. Uh, ideology, I guess. The point is, if someone is high risk, what is the downside of of not doing a life vest? You know, there's no real big downside other than patient discomfort. The point is, someone is high risk. I don't know if that we can design a trial where we're going to take high risk patients and then you know subject them to one thing or not one thing. Because in general, like for someone who is high risk, I would favor unless there's like. Uh, a lot of patient discomfort associated with that would favor them wearing a life vest for three months until it's safe or, or I mean, until they can get insurance approval for a defibrillator. That was the first comment. The second thing was with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. You know, it's like similar to say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a lot of times if you don't have the high risk, major risk factors for sudden cardiac death, if you look at the scar burden on MRI, I mean, like that is a very, um, I guess, uh, what should I say? It, 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 it is telling of those patients that may be uniquely at a high risk of sudden cardiac death. And go with, that will probably go in line with any other non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So again, with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, you have high burden of scar, probably your risk of sudden cardiac death is higher than if you don't have scar. And again, in those patients, uh, we, you, you could use this in a situation where, um, what is the downside? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, what is the downside? Like, why why would I not? Like, say, tomorrow I find someone with a non ischemic yeah. cardiomyopathy, I mean, scar burden 20, 15, 20%, I, I probably will put them on a life vest until the, I start them on heart failure directed medical therapy and then evaluate. Well, I, I think you brought up a good point. It's the question of making sure we define that high risk. So 20% scar, it makes sense. Yeah. But, uh, but when we, if we don't do that, because the studies have not used that, it will come back to portraying anybody with a low EF, they're, they're getting life vest, doesn't cause benefit. Now, even in those, you can argue if it is, what is that, six in 100, it's impossible to predict who those six are. Um, as an individual, you're right. But I think those discussions probably are not, appropriately portrayed because the patients are all like the ones who go home on who I know I don't think I'm benefiting them. There's no way I can guarantee that they're not going to be those six in hundred, but at the same time, those guys are like living in fear sometimes. And, and so those ramifications are true. So to your point, all of us probably are devising some alternatives in deciding the, 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 the risk, the prop that what what to Barry's point, what we need to limit is this overutilization in individuals who might not like, for example, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy guy with an EF of 20% who has no non-sustained VT, has no insurance. We're tapping into 
charity care of the hospital to spend all that money. I'd rather use that money to some other resort, right? But once they get slapped on, it becomes this tricky legal situation. And sure. uh, if, if, I think the, 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 it is inappropriate if, uh, if case managers and social workers or anyone else is recommending, because that's, that's a reportable offense. Um, and if anybody notices that, please let me know. And the fellows, especially, I think, end of the day, you want to practice ideal medicine. But Imad brought up a good point. As an individual, if a patient says, look, I don't want to be that six out of 100. I'll take my chance. I want it. It's 2B recommendation, so it's not 3. It makes sense. And if they want to pay the out of pocket and all those things, but it needs some amount of uh, conscious discussion, though. Yeah, further risk stratification will be interesting to, to see. I, if you want to refine this, you can risk stratify this and put get MRIs. That will be a, a, a device that LifeWest should be interested in sponsoring because the, the data has still been controversial, right? So they, can, they need to consolidate the utility. If you select the patients appropriately, you'll probably see some benefit and get approval. Yeah, I mean, and then there's so many ways to risk stratify patients with sudden uh, increased risk of sudden cardiac death and heart failure in general, regardless of their ideology, ischemic or non-ischemic. I mean, like if you have a hypotensive response to exercise, that is a high risk of sudden cardiac death. If you have, um, uh, there's so many. I mean, if you have exer exertion associated uh, arrhythmias, uh, like uh, ventricular bigeminy, trigeminy, or, or non-sustained VT, that is a high risk for sudden cardiac death. There's so many nuances to this. I, I just feel like I agree with you that like a generic, um, generic uh, what I call approval of life vest for anyone who come, has a new onset cardiomyopathy is probably ridiculous. But um, but if you have high risk features, and I guess we have to maybe sit down and and kind of uh, come to a, sort of a consensus on what we think are high risk features in ischemic and non ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, but but I think there is some role. I mean, it's hard to say that it's not 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 helpful. No, no, I agree. I think the simple things to me are non-ischemics who have non-sustained VT, non-sustained VT, you know, with not like a potassium of two point one. Those they've already been shown to be a higher risk cohort, even in those first first three three months. Right? That's an easy. <coughs> Right. Even ischemic? Uh, non-ischemic. No, even non-ischemic. Non-ischemic, non okay. Non-ischemic. Uh, MRI, of course, uh, has its validation. I don't know where the graphs uh, turn around from the SCAR standpoint. Any SCAR is better than, is worse than no SCAR, but I'm not sure where it bifurcates. I mean, HCM is above 10%. Uh, yeah, but, um, I think it might be about the same for the other. So I think we can internally agree that those should be the risk factors to use. And if none of them are there, um, it's, the utility is questionable. And then the decision making becomes very patient individualized. So, Excellent talk, um, Ryan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.